Hi, this is Alan Olson, and welcome to American Dreams. My guest today is Tino Go. Tino, welcome to today's show. Hi, nice to be here. Thank you. So, so Tino, you have a, a company that you've launched recently. Uh, but before we get into that, for the listeners, can you give your your background of what brought you up to where you are today? Yeah, sure. It's it's eclectic. Um, you know, first generation immigrant from Ohio, uh, from Indonesia. We moved to uh, Michigan when when I was a young boy and uh, grew up in Michigan. Uh, uh, leaving high school, I, I, I graduated high school with two art scholarships, principally for uh, photography. One sent me to Europe, the other one was for um, college. And in Europe, I, uh, you know, I did an internship at one of the big photo studios in Paris, and then I, I returned to school and to see a huge disconnect between the real world and the curriculum, so I dropped out after six weeks. And I started my own company to do advertising production services. And um, I ran that company for five years between uh, Detroit and then Los Angeles. And then I was recruited to Paris, where I, uh, I worked for a Parisian company for seven years, three years doing production, two years overseeing the Italian market and growing our market share and two years, the two last years overseeing uh, Northern Europe out of Dusseldorf. And after 12 years of, uh, you know, the frenetic pace of advertise, advertising, I was a little bit bored. I was looking at another 25 or 30 years of more or less the same thing, so I thought. Uh, so I quit and returned to Michigan. I, I got a uh, scholarship to study economics at the University of Michigan, followed that with an MBA in finance, followed that with most of a master in accounting, and um, started in corporate finance, which was my uh, goal to to really understand economics and finance, because prior to that, I, I felt like I was a like a leaf adrift on a on on, on a you know a ripple a ripple a ripple lake. Uh, I didn't understand how anything worked, and I wanted to understand. And um, so I, I started in investment banking, and, and then uh, the dot-com bust and 9-11 came around, and that imploded, uh, and went on to workouts and turnarounds. So I did learn something from my econ classes. I, I <laughs> And... Uh, did workouts and turnarounds consulting for a few years. That was that was a ton of fun. Um, learned a ton, and and then uh, when I met my ex in Cleveland, I moved there and started direct oversight of companies. My first job as a controller was for this t small twelve million dollar company. We grew it to eighty five million in five years through a couple of acquisitions and organic growth. And um, again, that was a trial by fire, ton of fun. Um, and my last company, I was, uh, you know, overseeing a um, $1.2 billion business unit of a, a chemical company um, where I was a CFO for a year, interim CFO while someone was on medical leave. And yeah, uh, that takes us to, you know, what I'm doing now, which is, I'll take it, uh, I'll call it my th uh, third, second, third adventure. Where but I'm this really, is the, this uh, this company you started from the, the ground up then, right? The, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So it all started and, uh, from an idea. Well, I like to I like to hear about about how that idea came about. So yeah, um, it was it was it was it was a kind of the, like the triangulation between three observations. The first one was. Well, the, 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 the case was I wanted to get a bookcase for my home and I couldn't find it, which is a very common occurrence because, you know, it had to fit a particular spot. And, and then when I discovered to get one made was a medieval process, I was just shocked that in the 21st century, you had to go through this really antiquated, out, outdated process to get wood cut in custom sizes. Um, so that was appalling to me. The second observation was, I knew the state of software and manufacturing automation through, my, through the jobs and through just general observation of the tech scene. 
And so the hypothesis was, these, if these uh, machines are digital, we should be able to translate what's in our imagination, what we want, and those machines should just perform. And then, um, so we built the technology around that. We actually earned the patent on the use of augmented and virtual reality to control those manufacturing robotics. So as you're changing the picture in augmented reality, the manufacturing instructions are dynamically changing simultaneously. Um, and then the third observation was, okay, there are thousands of these machines. And just from my corporate finance experience, I knew that whenever you have CapEx, you have cycles of use, utilization. And I was, I was surprised to find that the average utilization rate of some of these millwork machines, panel processing machines, was two hours a day. Thousands of machines, highly underused. That was that was the you know it's like we can create a virtual factory out of these underused machines, kind of like an uh, you know Airbnb or ghost kitchens type of uh, business uh, network. And so that's what we're building. We're uh, we're networking underused machines into a virtual factory, so that people can get custom made products using those machines, made in their hometowns, and on-demand hometown manufacturing, it removes 50% of the cost structure in the retail manufacturing to retail channel. Usually about 50% of the revenues are wasted on inventory overhead, just warehousing, movement of inventory, carry of inventory, and, um, and global transportation costs. And so that's how we compete with the existing industry because we have a more efficient cost structure and those savings let us reallocate to higher quality materials local manufacturing services creating hometown jobs we get higher margins than the industry average and because every item is customized for the buyer we get lower return rates and thus higher net profits too and then you know the byproduct of reducing these this global supply chain into hometown ecosystems is there are you know immense social benefit you know we're creating jobs we're advancing industrial innovation we're avoiding immense amounts of co2 emissions from shipping things around the world it's so it's uh, for all of these reasons uh you know, it was an idea I couldn't get out of my head, so I just had to. So, had to. so Tino, in the first year, you have 29 cities that you have sales and manufacturing uh, the partner network in, 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 in 29 cities in just 12 months. Yeah, because it's yeah. we've made it super easy for these local manufacturers to join our network. We, so when, when, we when it, somebody comes into it's, it's somebody comes into the network and signs up, uh, how is it, how does that all work? Are they uh, you know who who's giving oversight to the new orders coming in and you know what what role do you play with these manufacturers? We we do as much as possible so that the jobs for them you know the execution of these work orders is extremely easy for them because the they they tend to be smaller manufacturers under 20 employees and so the, their organizations are all bottlenecked at the at the management level or the design and engineering level admin's always a mess at, at these smaller companies and um and but at the on the factory floor there's almost never any uh, um, capacity issues on the machine. So that's what we're tapping into. And the way we make it easy for them is when a customer purchases from Baru, we, pro we provide the machine instructions and we issue purchase orders for the materials to be delivered to the local shop. So it goes straight to the factory floor you know the workers they they process they plug in the code they process the materials do a little bit of light assembly and it's ready for delivery 
So it's as if we were an internal engineering team providing more work orders. And that's how, that's, that's how, that's how manufacturers uh, find it really appealing to join uh, the network because ultimately it's just easy revenue for them. So Tino, I, I want to jump into team building because it seems like you're onto something right here that when, uh, when, when you're bringing a team together, how do you, how do you build, build a team out? Very carefully. Um, I look at three, uh, I, I have three uh, high-level considerations. One of them is um, what are their strengths? You know, I, 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 about a decade ago, I, I was exposed to strengths finders. And so it categorizes our talents and, um, our, and strengths into, into five, you know, into three main buckets. And those three buckets, they align really well with different jobs and then the strengths within those buckets align really well with uh, things that, um, you know, the talents that they're born, people are born with, plus the proverbial 10,000 hours of practice. So it, what I've learned is uh, when I'm leveraging my own strength and what I've seen when other people leverage their strength, they're 10x better than the average. And so, and not only are they 10x better than the average, they enjoy that activity. And so uh, I look for strengths I, and and you know cross reference it to the role I'm seeking, and then I look at uh, the the hip, the the behavioral um, expectations that I want in this organization. Behavioral expectations, behavioral uh, uh, behaviors that will reinforce the business that, that we're trying to build. And then the third thing is um, they have to be not afraid of uh, a certain amount of candor. Kind, but very, you know, very frank talk. So let's let's go looking at the potential for uh, Baru's uh, business. Where do you see um, where do you see the growth trend going? The same five years. Um. Did you ask where I'm expecting to be in five years? In five years, yeah. So based on where you are today, how big do you want to be in five years? I think um, our goal is to become a global um, company um, transacting about a billion or more of business because there are so many of these machines uh, available throughout the world and customization is. Um, so well aligned with the coming generation of consumers, you know, and uh, consumers under 40. They want things customized. They want it online and easy and fast. And um, and ultimately our infrastructure, uh, you know, um, is replicatable in every high labor cost country where these you know, where these underused machines are located. And so, um, yeah, we have, you know, one of our first investors uh, um, said that he's convinced we're going to be the next Amazon because what Amazon did with um, distribution innovation to serve, um, you know, unique customers' desires, uh, we are doing at the fun at the manufacturing level. And so as, you know, the first group of machines are panel processing machines and, but, and we'll fill up that um, manufacturing capacity by selling products that those machines will make to different groups, but we'll eventually integrate in other machines. And ultimately it's all about turning um, what's in someone's imagination into a physical project, product using digital fabrication. Someone else's digital. So, um, three <laughs> D printing is this playing into your model absolutely. then? The yeah, digital. Absolutely. So let's see if uh, uh, as as you're looking into a, a billion dollar company, 
Uh, obviously, it's going to take some capital to get there. And then, uh, ha- have you taken capital so far? Yeah, we've been funded uh, by angels to the um, in the amount of three hundred and thirty-seven thousand. We are raising a seed round right now. Um, with um, the goal is a million dollars, and with a million dollars, I expect that we'll within two years we'll be at that twenty-five million uh, annual you know run rate and. Um, six or seven million in margin, which will just reinvest in infrastructure and and um, sales acquisition. The because uh, yeah, we've already seen the the leading indicators that um, is, um, that lead me to believe that's very realistic. And beyond that, you know, we'll continue to grow. Ultimately, it's. The, the growth rate is possible because um, unlike a lot of marketplaces and platforms they, that take a big, we're actually selling the product. And our margin is variable according to how much, uh, how much volume we put through these underused machines. Because with the volume that generates economies of scale, we share those economies of scale with the manufacturer, but it also creates, you know, allows our margin to increase, the margin rates to increase. And so, you know, our average selling price is around $1,300 so far, but uh, we just launched with custom kitchens to property flippers, and they're pulling more demand than we can actually satisfy, uh, considering I'm still a, we're still undercapitalized and understaffed, um, but the yeah we have uh, we have very strong growth expectations. We've already seen that demand. We've already seen product market fit uh, with the property flippers. They will be repeat buyers, and they they generate the volume for the economies of scale and margin. So tell me about your patented method and, and how you're integrating augmented and virtual reality into manufacturing. Yeah, so uh, the general premise is, okay, those, the machines are digital. We should be able to instruct them what uh, those machines do with what's in our imagination. And augmented and virtual reality is, is a way to communicate what's in our imagination to, into code. And so the typical way a customer orders a product to be made is they, they, they interact with an engineer and the engineer interacts with a manufacturer and they go through these iterative loops. You know, the engineer designs something, shows it to the customer and the customer says, I like this, but I don't like this. Would you tweak it? And so it goes through that redesign process. That is super inefficient. Uh, the idea behind the patent was, why don't we take the final picture and allow that to be the configurator? So change the picture and that changes the manufacturing instructions. And that's, you know, and generically start from the goal and, 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 and go upstream. So, so Tino, for a person wanting more information on Baru, uh, how would they go out ahead and contact you or get a hold of the company? Yeah, um, I can. My email is tino at hellobaru.com, T I N O at H E L L O B A R U.com. Uh, they can check out the website at hellobaru.com. We are building a baru kitchen.com website, which will be our second product category. Eventually, we'll have many others. Um, yeah. very good well I appreciate you being with us today on American Dreams it was fun it's uh, one of my favorite topics talking about Baru excellent well, I've been visiting here today with uh, Tino Go uh, he's the founder of Baru and uh, thanks for joining us here Thank on you. American Dreams <laughs>